Hi there. Today, let's talk about how popular songs in English mirror our attachment styles and our relationship experiences. Welcome to a special English lesson, which will do more than just sharpen your language skills. Have you ever wondered how the songs we love reflect our psychological patterns? Let's talk today about an interesting study on how relationships are portrayed in popular music. I love a topic like this which brings together things that we're aware of, but which we haven't consciously linked into a new insight. That's I-N-S-I-G-H-T. An insight means you go, ah, or, oh gosh, yes. And it's also known in English as a light bulb moment, or even an aha moment. Let's try and have one of those in this podcast today, as well as some excellent practice at English language listening as usual. Hello, I'm Hilary and you're listening to Adept English. We will help you to speak English fluently. All you have to do is listen. So start listening now and find out how it works. This isn't just another English lesson. It's an exploration into the psychology of relationships and popular music. So today I'm offering you an English language podcast with added interest to help you listen for longer. And as you already know, there are plenty more podcasts on our website at adeptenglish.com. But go to our courses page to buy bundles of 50 podcasts or more. You know that the English language learning part of your brain will love that. And why not kickstart your English language learning for 2024? Imagine this, you're listening to one of your favourite songs and the lyrics seem to speak directly to your heart. Why is this? So one of the theories used by psychotherapy, which has been popularised online, that means it's become common knowledge online in recent years, is attachment theory. That's A-T-T-A-C-H-M-E-N-T. The British psychiatrist and psychologist John Bowlby that's B-O-W-L-B-Y, was the first to put forward the idea that attachment and the want to make relationship of one of human beings' main goals, main needs even. It's what motivates so much of our behaviour. This seems obvious to us now. Bowlby was around in the 1950s and in the 1960s, so we've grown up with these ideas being widespread. Our need to form relationships is a fundamental part of us being human. It shapes how we interact with others. From the secure feeling of a mother's love to the complexities of adult relationships. And this isn't just about people. We see it in animals too. Dogs, cats, even lambs show attachment behaviour. Thanks to the work of people like Yak Pangsap, we recognise it in other animals too. There's a reason why reptiles in the pet shop don't cuddle up with one another like puppies and kittens do. The reason for this difference in behaviour is down to the structure of our brain. But that's another podcast, if you're interested. But children need to be attached to other people and feel secure. That's S-E-C-U-R-E. And secure means the person that you love isn't going anywhere. They're not going to leave. They'll be there for you. We understand this implicitly now. But before the work of John Bowlby, when the work of Sigmund Freud was dominant, the influence of attachment as a normal human need wasn't really seen or talked about very much. It's not present in Freud's work. And maybe this says quite a bit about the man himself. If I think back to being a child myself, I can say with absolute certainty that my primary attachment figure was my mother, the person in the world most important to me. And as a child, I can recall clearly, yes, being close to her, knowing she was there, having her attention, was pretty motivating for me as a young child. Luckily, I got what I needed there most of the time. But it underlines its importance to me. What would it have been like if I hadn't had that love and attention? How would I be different now? There's a lot to attachment theory. 
Let me know if you'd like to hear more about it in a future podcast. There's the famous work of Mary Ainsworth and Harry Harlow, as well as John Bowlby, which added to the theory. Again, if you're familiar with psychology, you may know these names, you may know this work. But translating this psychology knowledge into how it works in practice in relationships is a whole other subject. It's well worth understanding, but the links aren't necessarily obvious. So briefly, what is the attachment theory? that comes mainly from the work of John Bowlby. And what does it teach us about relationships? The theory that is useful for each of us to understand about our patterns in relationships is that we all form attachments in one or two of several ways. You may be one of those fortunate people who are securely attached and in a securely attached relationship. In that case, relationships are just not a problem for you. Relationship just works and it's simple and comfortable. If you have one of the other attachment styles, on the other hand, it means there are likely to be more problems. If you have an avoidant attachment style, for example, that's A-V-O-I-D-A-N-T, that means that your feeling, your natural instinct is that relationships are risky. You might get hurt or we're still trapped in a relationship. Relationships feel dangerous emotionally, so you try to avoid them, or you play around the edges of relationship and make sure you've got the upper hand. You may avoid relationship altogether, or you may date, but avoid anything that sounds like commitment. And if you have the opposite problem, we'd say that you were anxiously attached, or you have anxious attachment, A-N-X-I-O-U-S. There is some confusion in the naming here, which probably reflects how the ideas have evolved. So today, when we say someone has anxious attachment, we usually mean that they're very dependent emotionally on the people they're attached to. So much so that all kinds of things may generate anxiety. Any possibility, even a tiny risk to the relationship may create anxiety in the anxiously attached person. So people with anxious attachment can be quite clingy. We use that word of children, where they cling literally to the parent. They may have their arms wrapped around your leg. For a three-year-old, this is perfectly normal in their development. But as adults in relationship, someone with anxious attachment may need constant reassurance that you're not going to leave them. An anxiously attached partner may not like you going out or working away, or they may send you text messages all the time. Anxiously attached people work very hard to ensure that the relationship continues. So there are many ways in which these attachment styles play out, but it's perhaps most visible when people are dating. D-A-T-I-N-G. I spend a lot of time as a psychotherapist talking with people about the ins and outs, the actions and reactions on dating apps because it's so problematic. So let's talk about that study that relates this to music. Researchers analysed the lyrics, that means the words, of top hits from 2019 to identify what attachment styles are being shown in the songs. The study was called Love Lies, a content analysis of romantic attachment style in popular music by Mikkel A. Jorgensen Wells and others at Brigham Young University in Utah in the US. That's where the study was done. The link's in the transcript on the website, as well as the link to the article by Bianca Setianago, which brought this study to my attention. So the researchers took 100 popular songs, and unlike my songs in last week's podcast, they were fairly recent songs from 2019, the top 100 songs from 2019. The researchers analysed the words and the relationship attachment styles they felt were being shown. What I thought was interesting to start with, of the 100 songs, Only 13 were not about love or relationships, which meant that fully 87% of the songs were about this. Interesting in itself. Most popular songs are about love, romance or sex. On reflection, that sounds right, doesn't it? So of these songs about love, relationships or sex, 
the analysis also showed that 86% of songs about love showed either avoidant or anxious attachment. And this was further broken down. 33% showed avoidant attachment and a full 54% showed signs of anxious attachment in the song lyrics. I guess you could say that great art often comes from experiences of pain and hurt and difficulty. But the researchers found that only a small percentage of the songs showed secure attachment style or were neutral. That was around 14% in total on this. Perhaps relationships that are securely attached are less interesting to other people. There's less pain to talk about, of course, or sing about. The researchers also found that music genre, that's G-E-N-R-E, was related to attachment style. For instance, rap, hip-hop and R&B songs were less likely to show anxious attachment and more likely to show avoidant attachment. In these songs, it was noted that often the subject, that means the singer, did not need emotional closeness and thrived on being alone. Interesting too, song lyrics that focused on love were often either secure or anxiously attached and rarely avoidant, whereas songs which focused on sex were often avoidant in flavour. I guess in some ways this isn't surprising. The best songs often portray what we might call heartache, That's H-E-A-R-T-A-C-H-E. The pain we experience when a relationship breaks up, perhaps. Maybe this state of feeling leads to the best songs that are written. Examples from my recent podcast, 708, where I talked about music. You could say they certainly have Dido's white flag. Perhaps a little bit like German poet Goethe or Roman poet Catullus. People write their best material when they're in pain. And if I think of my reservations about Kanye West, maybe that's because it portrays an avoidant style of attachment. But what this study also worries about is the influence on teenagers of the attachment styles portrayed in popular music. There's concern about avoidant or uncaring attitudes, which could be portrayed as normal or how you should be. I understand that, but I think that the researchers have it the wrong way round and they're worrying unnecessarily. Teenagers listen to a lot of music and are often experimenting in having their first relationships and it can be quite painful. So these songs and song lyrics become important because they express the feelings that teenagers are already experiencing. And that's true for all of us adults too, and accounts for the popularity of many songs. We've all been there. My suggestion would be that our attachment style may influence our music choices at different times, but our music choices don't make our attachment style. Attachment styles are set instead by our own experiences in life, especially of relationship. This is what John Bowlby and others taught us. As ever, let us know what you think of this podcast. And if you want more on attachment styles, just let me know. Send us feedback. I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say. Enough for now. Have a lovely day. Speak to you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. Please help me tell others about this podcast by reviewing or rating it. And please share it on social media. You can find more listening lessons and a free English course at adeptenglish.com.